Okay, so thank you very much to Ice Whale and especially Maria um, for uh, hosting us here and of course the U.S. Embassy and IFAW for all your help and consideration and, and um, uh, you know, in making this happen. I think this is a really important series of events that, uh, workshops and events that are happening in Iceland. You know, it's all positive, trying to encourage, um, you know, to, to make a better product, to make better whale watching, to make it better for whales and for the people here. And uh, <clears throat> I think, you know, I love coming back to Iceland. It, you know, this is, I was trying to count, I've sort of lost count, that maybe that's a good sign. It's around 13 or 14 times. But I was really lucky to come before there was any whale watching in the early 90s and, and really to see, you know, just to be astonished at, at what kind of possibility there was here for developing a whale watching industry. Uh, you know, having been at that point to maybe 40 or 50 countries, uh, you know, it's up to about 60 now where I've actually gone whale watching. So I had seen it develop in a lot of different countries. And I came to Iceland and I thought, oh my God, it's so close to U.S. It's between U.S. and it's Europe and, and it's got all these whales and they're fairly accessible. You can even see them from land. You know, why isn't it happening here? So it was really exciting then, but you know, even our projections then of what we thought might happen, we were, you know, on the back of a, of a napkin, we were saying maybe 30,000 people and, and even that figure uh, people were laughing at, you know, that you know, you'll never get 30,000 people paying to go and see whale watching. So to see what has happened here and, and the way the numbers are just skyrocketing is, is really exciting. And I do, um, I do want to say I think the, the standard of whale watching here is very, very high. It, it doesn't mean that there isn't a lot still to learn and to grow with, but I think it is very, very high. And if you, you know, it's something to be proud of. We were up in Husavik yesterday, and it's, you know, it's extraordinary what they've done in this uh, fairly uh, remote part of Iceland. But, you know, in Reykjavik too, it's, it's a really impressive standard that's being created here. Um, so, um, so that with that, I, I'll, I'll start to ask a few questions. Uh, is Iceland a whaling country that does some whale watching, or is Iceland a whale watching country that does a bit of whaling? With one out of every four people coming to Iceland going out whale watching, I think that we can argue that Iceland is fundamentally a whale watching country, at least economically. But what about perceptions? What are the risks of potentially losing tourism if those messages are confused? And what can we do about the vagaries of the weather, volcanoes, lack of whales and dolphins? And I, I can't answer all these questions definitively, but I want to provide some thoughts that I hope will be useful in uh, thinking about these things and in shaping future marketing plans, with, uh, with partly with the idea of trying to spread the benefits that come from living in a country blessed with so many species of whales uh, and the chance to go whale watching. So uh, first I'm going to look at a couple of things, some overview trends, and I think that a lot of what I have to say is in view of uh, a couple of things I'm going to mention now. First is the growth of whale watching. Um, you can see on the graph started in 1955 in California um, at uh, uh, pre-Beach Boys even, I mean it was, it was really, it was a California trend, you know, in the sort of California um, fashion of doing things, but grew very slowly. And I managed to rescue this fantastic poster on the right hand side. This was the actually, what we reckon is the original boat that went whale watching, the Betty Lou. However, this was in their second season in 1956. And I love the um, underneath whales, real ones. You have to say that in California because, you know, you, you never know what they're going to try and uh, throw at you or produce. Um, and then underneath uh, also the, um, the price, $2 for a whale watch for adults. And uh, the year before it was $1, so it had already gone up uh, considerably, showing that there was some demand. 
But it grew very slowly, and by 1981, there were only a few hundred thousand people per year going whale watching. Actually, it was around the size of what it is in Iceland now, in 1981, worldwide. And then there was very steep growth uh, kicking in, especially in the late 1980s, early 1990s. And the world growth rate from 1988 to 98 was 12% average annual increase per year in terms of the number of, of uh, whale watchers. And that was three to four times the rate of overall tourism. So that was a really steep rise and that's when it really started to take off worldwide. Now you can see the problem areas here in section B. That was the growth rate I was just referring to. And that's when we started to see these things uh, developing uh, these really big problems. For example, in Tenerife, in uh, uh, the Canary Islands, <clears throat> from zero whale watching to um, uh, a n you know a number of several hundred thousand happened in a matter of two or three years, with more than 150 boats going out whale watching, all unlicensed. Some of them coming in, actually sailing into the to Tenerife um, for the season, just putting a sign out with belugas, belugas on it or something like that and uh, bringing tourists out. And they were really like drinking tours, essentially. People diving off the boat uh, around the whales. It was completely unregulated. And it was also on a really fixed, small population of pilot whales, about only about 400 pilot whales and uh, a few hundred bottlenose dolphins. So the ratio to operators to whales was pretty high. Um, also, similar problems happened in Quebec, where it grew very rapidly. And you know, the, 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 the problems are not just limited to uh, boats on the water with whales, but it's also this issue of um, how are you going to handle all these tourists? You know, are you, go are you suddenly launching into mass tourism, you know, from being a quiet, sleepy town? Well, Tenerife could deal with it at some level, but other places uh, in up the St. Lawrence in Quebec, they had severe problems, and, and other parts of the world, they have problems. And we can see the growing pains, uh, of course, in parts of um, Iceland as well. Kaikoura in New Zealand, for example, decided, uh, had a, a community meetings when they were trying to decide whether to uh, build big hotels and go for the mass tourism, and they decided they wanted to keep the character of their town at you know at some reasonable level, and uh, so those decisions, those kind of planning decisions, are very difficult to make. They require the whole community, not just the whale watch operators, of course, uh, but are very important. So, what's the picture in Iceland? We've seen from Maria's talk, um, but I want to point out that you know in the world context, this is some of the fastest growth in whale watching uh, anywhere in the world over this period from 1995. And if we look specifically in the period from 2010 to 2014, we're looking at 19% average annual growth per year. And it looks like it's still going up. I mean, out on the streets, it's full of tourists. I, you know, it's really uh, Husavik. I could not believe, you know, I, I was in Husavik when there was, you know, you couldn't find a tourist. It was really tough to find a tourist on a given day, even in May. And, uh, you know, it's really swarming. So 19% is a really high percentage. I mean, it, if you're looking at your business and you're thinking about growth, that, that seems very sort of warm and fuzzy and lovely. But um, as the economists point out, 1% or 2% growth, you know, in a company or wh whatever it is, when it's compounded year by year over a five or ten year period, that adds up very quickly. So 19 percent growth is is uh, is going to lead to very severe problems if it continues at that rate. Um, you know, very severe issues that you that are going to need to be faced uh, in view of that kind of growth. Uh, so. Uh, the uncertainties of whale watching in Iceland, of course, the weather conditions. 
up to 50% bad weather days also in Kaikoura. That's what they used to say. Um, and uh, so, you know, they, I think that's a, an issue that happens with whale watching all over the world. Uh, but of course, in Iceland, you know, there were some great winters in 2013 and 2014 when we went all, a lot of us went up to Grindefjordur and saw killer whales there in the winter, and, and that disappeared completely last year. So, it, you know, it does go up in cycles up and down. Volcanic eruptions, of course, real and threats of. The, the um, uncertainties extend to the economies of countries that are visiting Iceland. Um, the exchange rate is a big issue. You know, the fact that the exchange rate is a little bit better last few years, that has certainly helped more and more people come here. Um, and then there's the perception of Iceland, including weather, volcanoes, overall brand. So in order to deal with this in uncertainty, what I will argue is that we need to become more diversified in terms of tour products and involvement, and I'll, I'll go into some of that involvement in local communities. And we also need to do our marketing and build uh, stronger relationships with the customer. Um, so some of the, you know, some of these things we can control, uh, some, of the, some of them we can't. But the ones that we can control, you know, shaping perceptions, we really want to try and focus on. So I'm going to go back to fundamentals a little bit and try to think about the uncertainties and how to deal with them. And I think at the heart of this issue is the discrepancy between selling and marketing. And again, none of this is a criticism of how whale watching is carried on in Iceland, because I think it is, it is done at a high standard. Um, but I think, um, uh, you know, I think it's worth looking at this. So selling focuses on the needs of the seller, the operator. Um, and this was sort of more traditional marketing. But you know, as we see marketing more you know, these, uh, the last few decades, it's focusing on the needs of the buyer and the customer. Definition, a simple definition, marketing is the management process responsible for identifying, anticipating, and satisfying customers' requirements profitably. I'm sure somebody added that last word to make sure at the, when they were doing the definition. Um, so the customer must be involved in the process as a partnership. So this transaction, on the left-hand side, the transaction uh, marketing approach that's more traditional. We can't be a self-centered hermit crab, uh, you know, with our business crawling into our shells and carrying it around with us, you know, separate, separate from the rest of the world. Re relationship marketing is more this partnership approach. Um, with transaction marketing, the sale is the end result. It's me-orientated. Uh, versus relationship marketing, uh, it's long, longer term thinking, we orientated. Again, with transaction marketing, uh, it would be more uh, the, this persuasion to buy, a need to manipulate people to win, versus focus on creating positive relationships on repeat sales, providing trust and service. Uh, stress and conflict conflict to win the transaction with transaction marketing, the old style, versus um, setting up the partnership. You know, and the whales are our partners too, so they need to, need to be treated well. So this is always my slow transition because I've got a, a deep sea squid on the next photo, I think. I don't know. I did this yesterday. Here we go. So transaction marketing yeah, is an, an anonymous person, uh, won by conquest in a planned event, uh, again, versus getting individual profiles of the customers uh, so that you can have a, continu you know, a continuing process can emerge. And I like um, looking at this. Um, I mean, every, everyone knows Steve Jobs um, started and made a success at Apple. But he also helped Pixar, you know, this extraordinary animation studio, uh, become successful. You know, they did the first um, all-computer film uh, to Toy Story. But since then, um, what some of you may realize, um, but I, di I didn't realize, that 15 straight films uh, launched at number one 
you know, which is quite an extraordinary feat. And in fact, when they have something that they think isn't going to work, they, they know they've got to move on. And, and so they've only had success so far. And I think since Steve Jobs died, most of the reports and the ver various biographies that have come out have really focused on his ruthlessness and his insistence on doing things his way. And I, this was characteristic of the early years, but he evolved with that, that um, way of thinking. And um, in this uh, new book, which I've been listening to when I jog, Creativity, Inc., which I really recommend, he's, uh, his collaborator at Pixar, Ed Catmull, talks about how Jobs boasted after he made this big sale, you know, 100 million US dollar sale of Next Software to uh, Microsoft, and he insisted you know, he just drove them to the wall and he insisted on making it a one-time sale, no updates, you know. They were going to have to pay extra for that. And actually, in retrospect, it, it died there. And in retrospect, uh, Jobs saw that that is a turning point, that, that his refusal to have a partnership with Microsoft as a customer made the deal far less successful. Um, and then, uh, you know, through his later relationships in Apple and also with Pixar, he really came to understand how to work with people and companies and uh, his you know, relationship with all the ad animators also epitomized that. So getting to know the customer. Uh, the next step in making a real partnership, you've got to know your, your customer. This is uh, uh, scenes from um, uh, Puerto Pyramides in uh, Peninsula Valdez where they have an annual Day of the Whale and they take everybody out whale watching and they have festivals and events and it's a real kind of interactive event with all their customers. So who is the customer? Uh, the starting point for all marketing. We need to learn something about tourists in general, but most important, we need to discover who are the whale watchers and the potential whale watchers. So whale watchers to Iceland, where do they come from? You know, we want to know the percentage from Europe, international, domestic, who are they? And then who are the potential? Uh, new whale watching customers. So what do we know about whale watchers? There's slightly more women than men go whale watching, but many more women go dolphin watching than men. Uh, these are sort of uh, worldwide um, figures. Average age varies, but it's generally younger appeal. Um, higher income level, the spend is more than the average tourist. Whale watchers are well educated. They place a high premium on seeing wildlife and uh, learning about it. They'll pay more for a good experience. But despite these categories, whale watchers are in this large general customer base. And uh, I think the technique of lifestyle segmentation can be useful um, for understanding tourists. So segmenting uh, travelers is just putting them in different boxes for what their, their needs and their wants are. or um, they're, they call them their topologies, uh, different kinds of travelers. So for example, to the UK, you might have, uh, if you were dividing it up, uh, you might have first time visitors. They'd be staying in London, seeing the basic tourist sites. Uh, the traditionalist you know, might travel on the trains and stay at uh, B&Bs. Explorer might go to Scotland or, or further afield. And the Britophile knows UK, up, stays in upmarket hotels maybe stay, uh, visits friends and relatives. So this is hypothetical for Iceland. Um, I'm, not, I'm not at all an expert on tourism in Iceland, but I, this is my first take of how one might look at it as a, you know, as a straw man. Uh, first time visitors staying in Reykjavik, going to the Blue Lagoon, maybe they consider a whale watch trip. Um, the explorer, you know, glaciers, volcanoes, the in interior of Iceland. Uh, Icelandophile knows Iceland, maybe does the upmarket shopping and hotels, uh, that sort of thing. And then uh, the, the more dedicated whale watcher um, that uh, might do a lot more serious whale watching. So if we try to segment the whale watchers specifically, we uh, going to Iceland. We might have first-time whale watchers, uh, the young woman, uh, nature dolphin lover, nature enthusiast, diver, school-age group. 
school trip group. We could, you know, we could divide it a lot more than that, but that gives you, um, uh, you know, this is just hypothetical as a starting point. So if we're going to address the needs of those first time whale watchers to Iceland who've never seen whales, you know, what do they need to be sold on? It's partly safety and risk. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about risk in a minute because it's, it's a multi-faceted thing, but what about a land-based trip or a first time short cruise, especially for beginners uh, in fairly protected waters? Um, the young woman nature dolphin lover may want to see dolphins a few times over several days. What about a special dolphin or porpoise weekend marketed to young women travelers? You know, I know there's a, a good supply of porpoises here, and sometimes the whales aren't around. You know, maybe that is something that's uh, saleable. Uh, the more knowledgeable nature enthusiast, there is so much extraordinary possibility with Iceland, you know, with being on the mid-ocean ridge and, uh, you know, the story of the life that, you know, carries on beyond that ridge when it goes into the mid-Atlantic ridge. And, uh, you know, I've been doing a lot of writing on this subject popularly recently, so it's, it's on my mind, but I've, I've been bringing Iceland into the story because I think it's just a fantastic place to uh, tell these kinds of things. and. Uh, I know Esbjorn Bjorgmundsen is, is uh, working on a new geology museum and hoping to tell uh, some of those stories. So that, that's the kind of thing that could enrich somebody who's also interested in um, you know, nature, all aspects of nature. And uh, the other one, the, the diver, well, this could be anybody really, but. This was also in the, uh, the Creatures of the Deep book that I was working on, that I've just finished. Uh, the 400-year-old clam story. Actually, there's a 507-year-old is the oldest, the Ming clam, found in the waters off northern Iceland. I mean, there, there's a secret of longevity in the waters of northern Iceland. It, it kind of reminds me, in a way, of the, you know, going, going to the Blue Lagoon before there were any fences there, and you just slipped in the water, and, you, and you know, somebody told us to take the mud and, you know, it was really good for you. And, it, you know, it, it was, now it's, of course, a big worldwide marketing thing. Well, the, the waters of northern Iceland, I mean, that's an animal, that's the oldest animal known, 507 years old. How does it do that? You know, what's special about that, that those conditions? Uh, could be a great, um, I'm not suggesting they collect them, of course, but a multi-day live aboard trip to see whales as well as do some of this uh, diving could be interesting. Okay. School or club group, young people, you know, um, creating fun educational trips, you know, that could be something that could be done um, with one operator or with um, out of a community like Husavik or some of the other communities. Um, and that could be um, a way to, to bring in. There are so many school trips going all around the world. If you get on that network, I think that can be a really... Uh, um, really positive thing. So, um, how to create it and keep a relationship with whale watchers. I'm going to talk about a few ideas here. Um, I think the first thing is telling good stories about whales and their ecosystems. This is a, a killer whale named Businka, who uh, we work with in Russia, with a team I work with in uh, Kamchatka. And uh, Businka is lost at the moment, but we tell her family story and invite um, some of the passengers um, on this expedition to, uh, um, to, to try and take photographs to find her, you know. And so we've had very good reaction to this kind of approach of personal stories with the whales. Um, you know, letting participants help find whales, you know, showing them how to search, how to help with research, uh, encouraging, again, encouraging the photo ID, show them how to use a hydrophone. Um, uh, you know, I, I think um, the chocolate bar thing, uh, years ago, Mark Coardine and I had this uh, large chocolate bar. If you saw a, uh, a whale, a medium-sized chocolate bar, if you saw a dolphin, and a small chocolate bar for a porpoise. Uh, for the for the first customer who saw them, 
you know, so everybody, of course, is, you know, staring out to sea then and is quite keen. Um, and that worked very well. But I think, you know, also I was, I was mentioning um, yesterday, I think maybe, maybe that the order should be reversed to give harbor porpoises a little bit more uh, attention and appreciation because they have been, you know, demoted everywhere, you know. But there are, there are places where they do harbor porpoise watching, so it is possible. Uh, another idea is the Citizen Science Club, and uh, this is uh, uh, actually this is a bird app, and Barbara's going to talk about um, uh, you know very exciting development uh, with with uh, an app as well that can be used here. But uh, I was very impressed uh, recently talking with the bird people at a conference and seeing this um, bird watching app that all of the um, um, you know, it was freely di um, distributed to all the, the uh, bird watching community. And they had put together uh, 50,000 sightings in a really short amount of time. And we're starting to publish these, in fact. Um, and the secret was that, you know, even though this was citizen data, if you, if you left the data on the, um, uh, if you tried to publish citizen data, um, or if you tr tried to use citizen data to argue for protection, it was really difficult. But if you could get it published in a peer-reviewed paper, which, which you can do, you know, if you follow all the protocols and everything else, uh, it was a very powerful tool. So the bird people, you know, we often in the whale world learn from the bird people because there are more of them and they, they're doing things uh, uh, that we're not necessarily doing. And I think that, that is a really interesting lesson. Uh, Whale, whale and dolphin adoption programs, of course, we know about that. Um, but that can be a way of bringing in the tourists to come back and see their whales. That's something that happens in uh, New England, Provincetown, um, where, where you've seen them recently. Um, and, and you get a lot of repeat visits of people coming back and wanting to see the whales that they know or that they've met or that they've adopted. Um, so then the next thing is keeping the interest going after whale watching. Uh, of course, e-newsletters and the social media postings have been really important. You know, images being the most important factor in all of that and a short amount of text uh, to drive it. This is actually something I came up with um, I found on the internet recently with the, what they reckon is the peak number of words um, for every kind of social media posting. You could, uh, you could get this um, by Googling the internet is a zoo. It's quite useful and, and uh, thoughtful. I think we all overwrite, for sure. Uh, so dealing with preconceptions of, of Iceland, customers may think it's located. Uh, this is, we're talking about uh, not the customers that are here, but this is maybe west coast of the US or you know, people that really don't know Iceland at all. Um, they may think it's located far away or that Iceland's, you know, primitive country. Okay, potential customers can, you know, uh, the way to sort of uh, uh, rebrand that or rephrase that, they could hardly imagine such a magical country so close to Europe and North America and prime tourism markets, yet so different and actually not so cold. I mean, I'm always impressed in the UK uh, you know, when people are saying, well, where's the best place to go whale watching? Is it Portugal? Is it France? Is it, no, sorry, it's actually the other direction, and it's only two hours away. People cannot believe it's only, you know, two hours and 15 minute flight. And, uh, you know, it's not that cold, and I, I can't tell you how many thousands of times I've had that conversation. And they're always astonished, you know, it's, it's so, uh, and, and Britain is close, you know, so I think, a lot of these uh, things uh, with the right kind of messaging can really turn around uh, uh, and get people interested. Uh, of course, the 100% literacy thing, you even see it on Iceland Air now. It's, uh, you know, that's, that's exciting coming, you know, from a country that has, I don't know, 70% or something like that. You know, there aren't any other countries, I think, that have 100%. <clears throat> so, um, more, more dealing with more pre uh, preconceptions. Um, they may be confused thinking Iceland is a whaling country. You know, pointing out that whaling was introduced to Iceland and Icelanders had no history of whaling. Most Icelanders don't eat whale meat. Limited whaling 
uh, occurs at present. Customers may think whales are a sure thing. Of course, we need to manage expectations and include other uh, um, wildlife species as well. Um, and the fact of being on the sea and how fantastic that is. So um, I'll talk a bit about reducing risk to the customer. For, uh, I'll look at four different kinds of risk uh, briefly. Economic, physical, uh, performance risk, and psychological. So economic risk is whether the, the customer can't judge whether it's worth the money. You know, and that's what we all go through that. We're looking on the internet. We're trying to find something. Is this going to be worth it or, or not? You know, and the solution in your marketing can be something like telling what percentage of the trips the whales are seen uh, and offer a rain check or money back if no whales seen. You know, and I've seen that happen in a number of whale watching places where the money back offer really is the, is the thing that, that uh, clinches the deal, you know, that turns it. Other, other places don't like to do that or don't need to do that. Physical risk, people are concerned about whether the trip is going to be safe. You know, of course, focus on safety. We want to do that anyway. Uh, the safety briefing. You know, you know, look at your customers. You can kind of tell which ones are a little bit nervous about going out on a ship the first time. Um, some of that can be addressed in brochures and on the internet, but a lot of it is really addressed person to person uh, in a direct way. And then uh, performance risk or psychological risk, you know, the idea that the trip could be low quality or a waste of time, you know, to be involved in. And then that's really the focus on high quality trips with the naturalist guide. The guide is all important. You know, that's, that's the real link that makes it successful. Even when you don't see whales, the guide can make a trip successful. So summing, summing up that relationship, it's good customer care. And I'll come back to that in a minute. I want to talk about branding now. Um, Four main aspects of branding, uh, Iceland whale watching, we could look at it the country level, the tour product level, uh, for example, you know, budget and quality product approach, the company level, and also the town and the community level. And this, you know, the idea, the brand is, you know, it's building emotion, coolness factor. And I think with brand, it's important, you know, people talk about building a brand all the time, but in fact, uh, you have a brand whether you try and build it or not. You know, the, people will give you that brand, you know. So you, if you want to pay attention to it and try and shape it to something that's uh, more useful and more attractive and more uh, resonant of what your company is or what your country or your tour product, you know, whatever it is, uh, you can do that. And, and I would, of course, encourage that. So. Um, yeah, and branding really influences customers, you know, their perception of everything. So branding by country, just to give you some examples, if we think about France, we get wine, champagne, brie, you know, uh, Kurt service, that's part of the Parisian brand. Uh, Germany, efficiency, Berlin, Berlin, edgy art scene, Canada, friendly, funny, I'm part Canadian, so I'm giving a positive spin on this one, so uh, maple syrup, I miss my maple syrup and my open spaces. Uh, Iraq, civil wars or cradle of civilization. And Japan, you know, technological earthquakes, tsunamis, Kobe beef, sushi, and, and whaling has to be in there. That's part of their brand, whether they like it or not. <clears throat> brand Scotland. I lived in Scotland for 20 years and you know I was always really really impressed with the way Scotland was able to sell itself as a small country all over the world and and bring enormous numbers of tourists and and handle them you know at a pretty high standard um, Edinburgh's second most visited place after London uh, and you know they do it with a, a mix of traditional things and a lot of new things you know they're breaking a lot of new ground they sort of invented the whole fringe festival idea uh, several decades ago which is now spread everywhere but 
you know, if you're, if you're in Edinburgh anywhere in the summer, it's non-stop festival time. It's just an extraordinary place to be. So Iceland, if you were going to brainstorm about, uh, and I'm sure people have, have been doing this, you know, in, in Iceland. So this is just my uh, 10 kroner worth, you know. So Iceland, pure, natural, wild, geologically raw, crime-free, whale paradise, blue lagoon, geyser, uh, Northern Lights, 100% literacy. You know, you've got to throw in wild storms there too, I suppose. Whale watching, you know, if you're branding that aspect of it, fun, discovery, shared experience, boat trip, wet, connected with wild, um, whaling, commercial, historical, food, old fashioned, animal suffering and death. The, you know, that's what is going to come from that part of the, of the, um, from that word. So branding Iceland whale watching, I think the possibilities are endless. You know, the, the mythic side of Iceland, I think is really fascinating to people when they come here um, and, and brings a certain number of people here and, and people that are interested in whales. I'm sure this is a huge overlap. Branding Iceland whale watching, you know, I love the idea of the, the geysers um, uh, being a bit like the whale spouts. Um, I remember uh, somebody brand, uh, actually a Japanese ad man who's a, who's a passionate whale watching guy that I know, uh, had, had all these products that he developed for, um, you know, trying to brand whale watching in their, their community in um, Kochi Prefecture. And one of the things he had was a can of um, whale soda, which was actually just water. And he said, and I, and I was really puzzled with this, and he shows it to me, and he says, no, you just shake it up really hard, and you open it up, and you get the spout, you know. So it's really basic, but, uh, but quite clever. So branding the big picture, is Iceland a whale nation or a whaling nation? Uh, customers in the world want to know. You know, I think branding at the country level is very difficult to control. And, uh, you know, it depends on the country and power, uh, difficult to influence. Um, so it may be that um, you need to focus on branding at the community, company, um, and the um, smaller level, the tour product level. So if we look at tour product, at least, at least for now, you know, because those are the things that you can control. The tour product level, um, you know, developing more diversified tours, which really I, I don't need to talk about. You're doing that already here. Thinking about what you're selling with whale watching. You know, it's an experience, uh, an informed experience, an authentic experience, uh, and, and an emotional experience. Uh, if we talk about tour product, how do we create a competitive, high quality whale watching product? Um, we, um, uh, the customer must, must feel that they're, I, th I think with high quality whale watching, the customer really feels that they're learning something important, they're having fun, uh, they're helping scientific research, uh, they're doing something good for whales in the sea. This is a sort of full uh, picture if they, if they were able to get all these things. Uh, doing something good for the community and for customers and visitors. And having a shared experience, you know, that's one of the most wonderful things about being on a great trip when you see something special. To create that, you, you need to ensure that the period before and after a whale watching trip sets the scene, and then it enriches that customer experience that you have on the boat, you know, with the, uh, with the nature guide. Um, so this, I think this, all this customer care stuff, it really has the potential to greatly improve and expand the reach of whale watching. Uh, you also, of course, need to think about what tours are done, you know, how, how tours are being sold and how they're being done in other parts of the world. Everybody has their iPad, they're choosing where they're going to go on holiday based on, uh, you know, a scan through what whale watching turns up on the first Google page. You know, so all that stuff you've got to really be aware of as well. You can't just be uh, working on your own country. So at the, again, at the company level, um, special hooks or product advantages, talking about these are whales and dolphins we know by name. 
You can help identify them and photograph them too. Um, this uh, species behavior or this area is unique for these reasons. I'm going to talk about something uh, like the ice whale trail I'll talk about in a minute. Slow whale watching. A friend of mine in British Columbia runs his, uh, the last five or six years has been running his, uh, um, his boat, the Geekami, which is shown in the picture there, at half speed and uh, half throttle and, and has saved tens of thousands of dollars in uh, gas. And also has, he, he in terms of uh, interviews with his uh, whale watchers, with his visitors and everything, a lot of them are put out, uh, some of them are put out by it when they go out very slowly, but by the time they're coming back, they're really, really on side with the whole idea. They haven't missed anything along the way. You know, I don't know how many times I go out on a fast whale watching boat, and my tendency is always to go to the stern and look backwards at what we're missing, because invariably you'll see something coming up. So that, that slow approach is also a lot more ecological, you know, feeds into the slow whale, whale the slow food movement. Um, I think it's a nice concept. Um, you know, just again, you'll learn more about whales on our trips, you'll help the whales too, um, and, uh, and this idea of customer care, you know, all the things that you can do to uh, help your customers. So the tour product level, um, you know, moving up to the community level, uh, this, uh, these are actually all the ways you can go whale watching in Kaikoura, New Zealand. Um, they did a, um, instead of letting, uh, well, there are two countries that have, uh, South Africa and New Zealand, that have had permit systems before they started whale watching. And so they've restricted the number of operators. Uh, so this is something that uh, some countries have tried to do later on. It's much more difficult to do later on, but it is possible. But uh, what New Zealand did was that they diversified through the industry. So they had dedicated, a dedicated dolphin watching company, a dedicated whale watching company, a land-based company, actually a couple of aerial um, companies uh, doing flights after they did some studies to sh you know, try and reduce the noise. I don't know how uh, long-term successful that one's been. But that diversification uh, worked. And also a lot of uh, the community um, uh, that, you know, they meet together about this. They've worked on different special events, festivals, a marine wildlife center, um, you know, special exhibitions. All this stuff is part of whale watching too. It's not just the tours out on the boat. Um, so this is just from the Ice Whale uh, webpage because I think, you know, there, it looks like uh, the community building is is trying to happen here and it's really very positive and very strong uh, and I would just encourage that uh, to keep going. Um, branding community whale watching, you know, through things like this, you know, Husavik Whale Watch Capital of Europe. I remember seeing that sign for the first time, really shocked having been to Husavik when there was absolutely nothing there and suddenly you come to the turn of the ro road and there's this almost a billboard it seems by Icelandic standards um, you know and they were branding themselves as whale watching and why not you know at that time before whale watching had started in uh, Reykjavik uh, they were really um, you know giving some of the best whale watching in Europe absolutely M you know surest closest to uh, to, to um, the port and uh, you know really good customer experiences on those lovely old um, oak boats and uh, everything so all those things are important the harbor or the port designs I was um, going to show you this one from a Japanese whale watching community in Kurashiocho uh, done by Nemio Kubo who actually did the outside of the whale museum in Husavik uh, came over to paint that um, but this is um, a mural about three or four meters high by 45 to 50 meters long at the port uh, in Ogata, where they take people out whale watching, and it's a it's a very eye-catching um, brand for this uh, community, and people people come just to see this and be photographed in front of it. Uh, so it's you know a few more ideas uh, with the community whale watching. You know, it's not enough simply to show whales to people, but uh, uh, I think you have 
a mission to help people understand and appreciate the sea and connect people to the sea. That's coastal communities. That's really should be a big part of their, their role. And uh, again, main way to do this, naturalist guides, good guidelines and regulations, uh, whale watch centers, special programs on whales. But you can also do it with beach and shore cleanups and uh, uh, community newsletters and that sort of thing. Now this, um, I think, is really relevant to Iceland and uh, a lot of places around the world because whale watching is, is no longer new, a new thing. You know, there was a time when it was the brand new thing, it was the exciting thing. Uh, it was just developing and people were excited and companies were excited. But after a while, you know, you need to find a way to reinvest your energy and to, to really recreate your business, recreate the tour products involved in it, you know, rethink it, maybe bring in outside expertise. Um, I was intrigued with um, Creativity Inc., that book I was showing you with the, um, uh, by Ed Catmull with Pixar. They have an annual notes day when everybody in the company, you know, hundreds of people um, get together and they're allowed to, you know, they're allowed to tell anything to anybody else. I mean, they have a real, you know, they, they warn everybody, you know, some of these things may be disappointing to you, but this is part of our process of uh, really reinvigorating ourselves. And after that day, I mean, the, the, the change in that company is, is really uh, uh, stark and, you know, it's, it's a real kind of reinvigoration of all the values that they have. So I think, you know, tools you need to find tools, and you need to find ways. Otherwise, it just gets stale uh, being out there, whether you're a captain, a naturalist guide, you know, whether you're um, uh, you know, in the community with, with these other uh, uh, whale watching businesses. So it's important to try new things. Now, the other, another concept, um, briefly, I'm getting near the end, but I, uh, this idea of becoming a category of one um, this is another interesting book I've been um, reading. Uh, if you think about regions, the Champagne region for Champagne in France, that's a category of one. Apple is a category of one. Uh, Volkswagen. Um, Iceland could be a category of one, absolutely. There is only one Iceland in the world. You know, it's the most, one of the most brilliant categories of one. So I, in a way, I'd encourage you to read this book just to put Iceland into the category that they're, you know, into their, um, the thinking whenever you're um, uh, reading about this because uh, it could be a powerful way to help build the brand uh, even better. Um, and what they, one of, the, one of the insights from this book, I think, uh, that's most valuable is that with people doing their shopping for travel, uh, on their iPads and on the internet and uh, uh, there's been a sort of leveling. The internet's been a great leveling force. It's made, it's made price a lot closer together, you know, because people can so quickly find the best price. You know, so other companies, if they want to compete at all, they've got to bring it, bring it closer together. And it's made quality a lot, a lot better and a lot easier to detect. So really, your uh, you know, your, your unique selling point or your wow factor, uh, you know, if you, you want to use those traditional terms, has to be gold standard customer care or service. And that's, that's the way that you can stand out more than anything else. So I think Iceland has, you know, is on to that already. But, you know, I think you could do it more and more, and that's, that will be the real clinching point for uh, keeping it going. Another category of one idea that I've seen happen is with marine protected areas in different parts of the world. Uh, of course, Great Barrier Reef Marine Park, one of the first ones, became a, uh, its own category of one, drew enormous tourists, uh, you know, and still does. We saw it with uh, Scammon's Lagoon for gray whales in, in uh, Baja, California. Uh, originally, there were a few American boats coming down from San Diego, taking people into the lagoons. The Mexicans made it a protected area. They threw the American boats out. 
They took the, um, they let the local Mexican people um, run pangas in the lagoon. And I mean, they still let the American boats bring people close to the area, but they, they gave some partnership to local people. And, uh, and it brought, you know, just by that branding of the protected area brought a lot of people uh, to the area. Same thing happened with the uh, Dominican Republic Silver Bank Sanctuary, which became the Marine Mammal Sanctuary of the Dominican Republic. Um, when uh, Joaquin Balagar, the president, declared that in 1986, all of a sudden people were thinking, well, I've seen humpback whales off of uh, New England. You know, at that time there were already, you know, 800,000 people a year, or almost a million people a year going whale watching. Suddenly they realized there's this place where they breed and it's the same whales and that's where they're going. And overnight that whale watching um, was born down there and, and really grew very rapidly and is now a vital part of that community. So that was on the back of that branding for a protected area. It, it gives a signal to a certain, you know, not to every tourist, but to a lot of tourists. And it could be a way of, uh, of doing something like that in the future in, uh, in Iceland. So last, one of the last things I want to talk to you about is about um, land-based whale watching, because I'm surprised not more of it happens in Iceland. Um, in two different ways I see it happening in other parts of the world. In Hermanus in South Africa, they do have a whale trail, uh, but the main area where they do this land-based is uh, around a southern right whale uh, area where they come in very close to shore at Hermanus. They have a whale crier who goes around through the town during this peak period and he um, will have, on, he'll, he'll let people know when whales have been sighted and what beach they are they're at so people can actually walk to these various sites. And then they have guides at the sites who tell them about the whales. And So they've developed a, a purely land-based business. Um, more recently, um, some boat-based tourism has happened there, but they've restricted it to uh, one or two permits. So they're not letting it be a free-for-all, and they're not trying, they're making sure the land base still stays uh, as a strong element. Uh, so that's, that's one way. Another way that um, uh, is happening in uh, uh, the west coast of the U.S. and Canada, um, this woman, Donna Sandstrom, with the Whale Trail, has set, set up this group, the Whale Trail, and they um, have put up a series of all-weather signs at prime whale watching areas all along the coast. I mean, it started in Washington State. It's now gone up into uh, British Columbia and as far south. I was with her last year, and we were following the whale trail, giving a series of talks and that sort of thing. And we went as far south as uh, Santa Cruz. So she has signs all the way down there on some of the parks. And that is the extent of the, the southern orca community. That's their travel extent. So in a way, she sees this as a mission of informing people about the killer whales that you know, are all along their range and trying to keep that, that uh, population alive. You know, it's, it's down to its uh, last 80 or so individuals and um, needs a lot of attention from the public and interface with the public. So this is not a money-making thing, although she does have events in coordination with the community. Uh, it's been very effective. So I, um, uh, I want to show, I'm going to show a brief, a one minute video in a second. Um, but, uh, and this is my last, uh, last slide. This is, uh, uh, I sort of threw this image on here. You'll understand this in a minute. I'm, I'm not proposing that we paint the, uh, what's the name of that, of that rock? You know, right out of Grindefjordr. Yeah, Kierkefjord, yeah. And, uh, but uh, yeah, I was looking at Gisli's face the other day when I, when I threw this up there and hoping he wasn't horrified because he, he lives right near there. So, uh, but anyway, I'll show, I'm going to give you my conclusions and then I want to show you this one minute piece that will explain this little uh, image here on the, uh, on the wall. Uh, so, to enhance the benefits of whale watching, improve conservation outcomes, and reduce the risk 
from poor weather, lack of whales, and all those other risks. You know, most important thing, making a stronger partnership with customers and, uh, you know, creating this, uh, you know, developing more of this gold standard customer care. Next, working on trying to shape your brand at the tour product company and community level, hopefully leading to the country level, you know, when, when possible, as soon as possible. But I mean, making these strong uh, um, brands at these other levels is what you can do now in a powerful way. Uh, involving the community, spreading the benefits of whale-related whale tourism to the full community. And uh, I think a lot of these ideas and problems and discussions can be had and addressed uh, at the community level in partnership with whale watching companies and the related businesses, but also, you know, with harbor redevelopment and that whole image uh, stuff that's going to be happening in Reykjavik, you know, that's, that's the whole community as well. So I think Ice Whale has a, real, a, a big role as well as the larger uh, tourism infrastructure. So thank you very much, but wait, wait just a second. I want to show you this uh, video if I can get this up here now. So this is um, um, a friend of mine in Japan who does, uh, um, and does animations of whales and dolphins. So these are, these are not uh, life size or life, um, these are not videos of whales. These are, are animations. Um, which uh, uh, people interact with, and he's uh, just putting them out on. Uh, uh, actually, I have to change the. Uh, yeah, so, just a minute. I know I did this yesterday too. Yeah, I'll get it. So it can be done indoors and outdoors. <laughs> this was in Yokohama, just outside of Tokyo. And it's projected things on the uh, red brick warehouse. It's just, you know, by, by the end of the evening, they had um, close to a thousand people there. It was just uh, astonishing event. So he's able to ma manipulate it in, in his computer while they're watching. And this is going to be going to be used in, uh, I think, the National Aquarium in, in Baltimore. It's the first place outside of Japan. So thank you very much, and I'm open to questions if you like.